want to be seated now. Thank you. I hope we were able to enjoy the food and take the opportunity to engage in a meaningful discussions with our fellow participants. Now, we will continue our panel sessions to be led by Dr. Marley Habound and Dr. Brendan Fairbanks. Let's greet them with a round with a warm round of applause. Thank you. Can I help this? Buenos días. Ah, se oye, ¿no? Se oye. Debo hablar en español. <laughs> Un poquito de español. So I'm going to mix it. No, no, it says no, no. Okay, I can mix it. Thank you very much. I just love being here. I feel so homey here. Thank you very much for being here, for talking, for asking, for, for being part of this. Um, thank you again for the invitation. It's wonderful to, to be able to share, you know. And um, I was really craving to come here. Not because I like acting, but I really wanted to continue with my talk from yesterday. Yesterday, I just did, oh, doesn't want to. There, oh God, yes. <laughs> you see how powerful we are <laughs> all the way there. Okay, so the one yesterday said pretty much linguistic documentation must be a collaborative process. Today is revitalization, okay? And again, I'm gonna run, I'm gonna talk kind of fast because uh, I don't have much time. Okay, oh no, again, let's see. Please, hello. So just a reminder for you to remember how Ecuador is this very small country and the population we have, the indigenous population, the conflicts and problems we have with the official figures about the indigenous people. And also remember we have our 14 nations or nacionalidades and the 13 indigenous languages, Quichua here, many different languages in Amazonia, all these different languages in the coast. Yesterday we talked about the Tzafiki language, the spoken by the Sachila people, the true people, and also in the Galapagos we do have some Quichua. Okay, it's, it's just a reminder, or maybe for people that didn't come yesterday. Okay, so, no. This is gonna be a challenge, you know? Also a reminder about Oralidad Modernidad, this program, interdisciplinary program, community-based, working with the communities and mainly two big things. Documentation, we talked a little bit about that. And revitalization, we are going to just, what I'm going to do really is give you some illustrations of some of these actions here. Um, also maybe as a reminder, yesterday I did say, and I want to say it again, documentation re and revitalization should go hand by hand. And they both are processes. And from the start, when we document it, we do it with the people, that turns into revitalization, okay? Yeah. Um, again, that was from yesterday. Uh, our main question when we started working with Oralidad Modernidad was, uh, how do indigenous languages deal with global society? And then I also wanted to remind everybody that we do have this very dynamic perspective of language and culture and people, right? And um, we also support initiatives favoring language reinforcement. I, I'm talking about support because we work with the communities and if they don't want it, we don't do it. If they want it, we really try to work together, okay? And my final slide to remember uh, from yesterday is the way we work. We always work from the community, starting in the community. I always talk about the core of the community, the heart of the community in Quichua, Shungo, for you to learn that word, Shungo, from your very deep heart. And the idea is to go back to the community, first of all, right? 
And then we also want to impact on the rest of the society, okay? So uh, these are the steps we follow. I just put it there for you to remember. We start with the community and end up at the community, okay? Yeah. So now I'm going to go with some of the re revitalization illustrations. The very first one is the one about the mapping in a way that it's under voices and images of indigenous languages. Yesterday I showed you a little bit about the way we were, were being mapping uh, language vitality, right? But today I also wanted to let you know that we have also been mapping uh, through history, his, history starting 1950, all the official census. Did indigenous people appear there? Not really. Languages, not really. So we, were, we mapped the, the results of the census in 1950. That is the very first census where we asked a question about indigenous languages. And then 1990, in 70 we didn't, we didn't have a question there. And then in 2000. And, and we do see that people are invisible because of inequalities, right? People were invisible, and except for the Quechua language, the other languages appeared as dialects, dialects from Amazonia, dialects from here and there, okay? And then, well, this is our final map where we do have, like, the Quechua people, just for you to see what happens in history. You're gonna tell me, is that revitalization? Yes, because that gives us the opportunity of talking to people in the communities and looking at each one of these maps and noticing that we were invisible, many indigenous people were and are invisible, okay? And that really pushes people up to fight for their rights. And then this map, that kind of a map that you saw yesterday, this comes from a different place. Um, the ones we're been building about language use and laws and, and migration trends and everything. Uh, I should tell you we have already worked with the 13 languages and also with the varieties of some languages like Quechua. So overall, right now we have like 1,500 maps out of this, okay? And that really helps people see where they are, how they are, where they were, how they are moving from one place to the other, what's happening in each small location with the language. Okay, I think I will just go on. We also, uh, we also mapped um, based on the census and all the sensual information, the way people self-identify. This is very important if we want to see the official territories indigenous people have been assigned by the government. So that you see these little spots where they mainly are. So then we know the Sionas are there, the Tzachil are there. But of course, they keep on moving everywhere. So in these maps, one dot is one person. That's wonderful. We are not able to trace language use all over the country with all the migratory movements, but at least we know how things are, okay? And we know people are in contact and move around. Hello? Okay. Also, we didn't, I, we didn't even mention that yesterday, but I, th I thought it was very important to think about ourselves and reviving our lives and our history when we do talking maps. In many, many locations we do what we call talking maps. That is a map that talks. <laughs> talks in a way that people do the map, create the map, depending on what they did, what's more important for them, what's the problem, what are some of their worries, and what's happening with their children and their elders, and, and all the changes they've had in their town. And, and these are sometimes unpredictable in results. For example, in, in, this, in this meeting, which was up in the border between Ecuador and Colombia, and we're working with this group that originally was 
in Colombia and moved to Ecuador, not, not entirely, but they are right now in three different provinces in Ecuador, and they decided to write their own history. Nobody asked for it. So there you understand how writing, writing about yourself freely, writing your own biography and the biography of your people becomes a way of decolonizing writing, which is usually imposed, right? Okay. Good. So then in this section of voices and images, although all of them conflate in a way, um, I also told you about uh, all these narratives and conversations and interviews we had with people and what we do with them. The very first thing is that we have these individual DVDs that we give to people in the community. So they will see themselves talking. And people can also see them, right, if they want to. And also we can, we can find the most interesting and, and touchy stories about elders being alone with their language, being unable to talk to anybody. So, Mama Maria, they tell us, me voy a morir sin tener con quien hablar. I'm just going to die and I have no one to talk to. And this is very common when you're walking in the field and talking to people. Okay, and then something else, how through this very simple step of just giving people back, we have Taita Jorge, who's the founder of one of the poorest communities in, in the highlands in Ecuador. He, he always wanted to transmit knowledge. Well, he passed away a couple of years ago. And when you go to the community, you see his videos passing on and on and on in the community. And that's a great way to learn from him, although he's not there. Okay? So that is a little bit about, about voices and images which have been recorded and uh, has given us hundreds and hundreds of hours in text which are now being transcribed in, uh, hello, whoops, okay. They have been transcribed in, um, and also many people are working about it from the more linguistic viewpoint, right? Okay, now, the last thing I want to say about that is that, well, you can see a lot of these on, uh, on Vimeo. You can also see it in Oralidad Modernidad webpage. But it's not just the older people. We talk to younger people. We, we have recorded chants and songs and, and new creations from the people, okay? What I, I told you, we've transcribed. And then we have like a final text. We always go back to people and talk about the text to see if we are making sense because we do more of this work. I mean, our students do most of this work. Okay. So that's pretty much a very brief, brief summary about two one, two one voices and images. So now I'm just switching to two, two and two, three actually. And it's this project that works with us. Um, to do different things with materials. The name of the project is Así Dicen Mis Abuelos. Okay? Yeah. So, again, you know, following the same policies we have, it's a community-based activity, actually, it's a community-based project um, that wants to meet with our languages, not only indigenous languages, though, also different Spanish dialects from the coast and from the highlands. And um, the idea is that we are going to talk, we go there to talk mainly with people that usually do not talk. Although they are able to speak, they are ashamed to talk because they are old, because they, are, they have been told they are poor, they haven't gone to, school, to formal schooling, they are ignorant, and so on and so forth. So their voices have really been silenced. And this is a great opportunity for them to talk to the communities, okay? Now, this, um, this project is the one that actually produces 
culturally appropriate materials that return to the communities, as always, right? And promotes intergenerational transmission and also, watch out, intercultural encounters. I'll talk about that very briefly, okay? And they use a lot of new technologies. So just for you to have an idea how these so-called art workshops that we do are. You know, we get together in communities. They are the ones who decide what they want to do, how they want to do it. And somebody was telling me, but that's very childish. Well, it's not, because this is usually organized by the older people, by high school students. Um, we do very little, which is facilitate the space sometimes, something to eat, materials, and that's it, okay? We also do theater arts, you can see it there. And um, actually, the members of the community are the ones who really control this. These are great opportunity to see language in action. How people are talking to each other, how the children talk to each other, the elders to the children, the children to the elders, and so on and so forth, right? And it's a great opportunity to, to really have natural language in your hand for the linguist, right? Okay. So I think here I have one of the videos. No. Okay, so this is one of the workshops we did in Amazonia with the Wao Tededo people, but actually everything was organized by the high school students. They brought the stories, they said what you want to do, and so on and so forth. Okay. So I think here there is a very short video of a very tiny piece of a, of a workshop for you to see how it goes. Everyone is different. It just depends where we are and what the situation is. So should we, please? Thank you. Can we hear? Look at everything, there are very great details. <laughs> Sorry, I know, I know you want to see that, but I'm sorry, we don't have the time. Okay, so I don't know if you've noticed some very important things about this event. We were supposed to work this, this workshop, it was our very first one, in a school. So we had sent all these very official letters to the school saying, excuse me, but we would like to have this. And they say, yeah, come. The day we arrive, the teacher closes the door and says, I'm sorry, I need to go town, to town. So there is no way I am staying here. And everybody kind of freaks out. It's like, oh, what do we do now? And then actually, Fernando said something like, well, we can go anywhere. We can go to the stadium, that's the stadium, and we can just sit there and work. You know, it was the best thing that could have happened because everybody was able to participate. The parents were there, as you can see, 
working together with the children and helping, helping the children. There we could, we could hear what languages they were speaking to each other and there were some foreigners visiting and they also joined the workshop. So we could just see all this code switching and all the codes that were used and the way people talk to each other. Then I don't know if you noticed that these children, without having asked for it, decided to write the story that the grandpa had told them. And also they decided to read. So there you see how all these four skills about learning a language are emerging naturally. Nobody asked for it. Nobody, I mean, it was not graded, nothing. It was so natural, you know. Of course, some of the linguists have told me, but that's not well written. Who cares? They are writing it because they want to write it and they want to read it, right? So there you also know these children are bilingual. Of course, we have not gone through this very specific test to see which type of bilingual they are, but they are bilingual, as most of the children in indigenous communities right now, okay? And, and then what we do actually is that we get all this material, go to Quito, and produce things. Like this little story, which is multilingual and has kept all the designs from the children and the elders. Okay, so they really identify with this. And then we do have some animated designs, just for you to see how it goes, okay? It's a lot of work. Sometimes people want us to have this ready in like two seconds, it doesn't work. <laughs> okay, so these are the original designs from the children that we kept. Whew, I thought it was gonna take five minutes. I was gonna faint. Okay, and some of the production we have. Right? And maybe I want to pay a little bit of attention to this one. This is one of the last um, books we edited where we have like four different stories in five different languages with, with a DVD where you can choose the language you want to listen to. Um, it could be two indigenous languages or Spanish or English or French or sign language. I tell you why it's French and English later. Okay, so pretty much this is some of the material, I mean very little, where you have games and you have cards, flashcards and stories. Most of them are multilingual because we're also aiming to do more multilinguism, multilinguismo. <laughs> okay, and then we go back to the community and we do this all the time and we give them back everything so people are able to see and enjoy and play and take home these materials, okay? And we have also given these materials to schools, okay? As much as possible, okay? So you know what is interesting? When you go back to the community with some of the, these materials and they see it, new speakers emerge out of nothing. It's like, well, you, you want a story? I also have a story. You want me to speak Spanish or my own language? And you can see Gina and listen to Gina pretty much at Vimeo. And um, actually, she tells us the wonderful story of the way her people were born. Okay. And we've done this in many different communities, many, many different ones. So now they, they, have, they are organizing different things, like we want to have a movie about our oral tradition. And they are looking for producers to go on and do their own movie. Maybe it's, it's really worth it to introduce you to Fernandito. In one of these workshops in a community where everybody told us children don't speak any language, in indigenous language, they are Quechua speakers. All of a sudden, when we are doing our workshop, Fernandito arrives. And Fernandito, without saying anything, starts to talk to everybody in the workshop, straight in Quechua, with wonderful narratives. Narratives that had all the intonation of a narrative, all the metaphors, all the ideophones, perfect. As he grew up, he was ashamed to use Quechua in front of people. 
and decided that he just wanted to narrate in Spanish. He wasn't as fluent in Spanish as he really was in Quechua. So little by little, he's gained so much confidence that right now he goes and talks to people and tells the stories everywhere, including the movie. He's going to be the main actor of this movie. Okay? So we do discover these very positive, encouraging things while we do our work. Okay, so the other thing we did that time is to start working with more animated designs. And I did bring one for you so you can see a little bit of what we do. All the, um, everything is real, okay? Tarisha Rukuya Yonawa Queen Tarisha Tasha Waisaro Pisha Wayusara Mana Punjagama Puni Siri Hansi Nuganti Tota Waisara Yanusha Rukumama Nawa Rukuya Yawa Queen Tarisha Tasha So by Guna me Tota Samono Nisha Vidi Vidiona Mikunga Tota Pachtam Tota Mikono So by So by Tota Tota Luxing Niopa tempo ashka su paiguna tianuka. Paiguna shuti mi ashka wiri wiri. Chukuta aicha yayarika sa changawa. Chibi shukushilura tupasha chibi. Wanchingarauska pukunawa chibi me shuk supa y paktasha chiaicha yayara. Samaira supa ya pika. Chisupa ya icha ya ya wasima paktasha kari tukusha chibi warmira tapung maivira nyuka kunara churasha nisha napi warmi irimang maivira churahange chilaira churairi nisha chibi warmi iriparang aicha la manapamunicho nisha shungulara ni apamuni aishkai ya palyashapu shungu walyara ya nusha mikuichi warmi apisha shungura rika chibi mi irimang Kamba kusamiani, kamba kusamiani, kamba kusamiani. China shunguri man. Mama shungura pisha riparang. Manjarisha rimairin. Ushida. Luk shuktalia. Runa unara rimairi. Warmi riman karira. Ushida rikungami riuni. Chigama usara rikushun. Paisha mongama. Mama usara maskashkashina. Rikusha, Uma Washama, Supainaira. Chibi, Warmi Rimashka, Supaira. Rikunga Miguni. Chita Rimashka Pai, Wasimanda Luxin, Wawa Pondalia Rivskai. Chautinambilla, Mama Tupairin. Chiliaktai, Shuraimira Rurayanushka, Chibi, Wawa, Rimairin, Runa Unara. Chu Supainuka Wasibi Mitian. Si ratulia y andara ranum, su cultura ranum, si vi su paira ruta chingawa. Mamara achara pitisha, cari cuenta de curingawa, ama su paira parengaj. Si vi chi su paira pactasca, si yaktama, mas cangaj, guarmira. Mana tu pan y tu cuesta andarisha a Sara o pichinum. Su paira anda machasca, y si guasawalia que es nanga callarín, y runa una tandarisha. Umai bi makanun, i cimanda wasa utuma kacanun. Rupas kacenalia supa i pinyari syariman. Kangunara ma. Ana sakisacu, shundo ni tukuni. Kangunara yawarda upisha mi kausasi. I don't know how much you understood of Quechua or Quechua from Amazonia in Spanish, but pretty much this is the way all the sicknesses and diseases appeared. Because the devil decided to take this husband's soul, and he wanted to pretend he was part of the community. When he went back home with um, the hunting stuff that he got, he had got, he said, I only got this, and gave her a heart. And said, 
please cook it, I'm hungry. But then the hired talks to the wife and says, I'm your husband, I'm your husband, I'm your husband. You know, what's very interesting is this one phrase, when you listen to the speaker, you see the way we say that phrase in, in Highland Quechua, in Amazonian Quechua, is different. So that's wonderful, one phrase, and tells you about uh, dialectological differences. Okay, but going back to the story, she goes to the, she actually discovers that the man who's there is the devil. So she runs to the community and the community help her, help, yeah, they, they help her. And finally, the devil comes trying to look for her and he gets drunk, they kill him. And in revenge, he decides to come back as all the mosquitoes and viruses and every little thing that may kill you. So that is the origin of sickness in the region, okay? So you see what's going on all the transmission, all the, the performance, all the learning, you know, about well-being and not being very well. Okay. So, in addition to this and many other things, I just wanted to show you that we usually do a lot of walking and recognizing the field. Because we talk about places, we talk about food, we talk about many different things. So. This is a way of going back to the field and walking through it and looking at the plants and seeing what they have, right? But of course, that, that means we also need to know what we eat and how we eat it and what's tradition and what we're forgetting and what's the meaning of each one of these products and how we cook it. But this is something usually organized by the community. They say, well, maybe we need to talk about this because people are eating junk food. So let's do something different. Let's go in and try to find our traditional healthy foods. And they cook and they eat and they have a great time. They do a lot of, of theater and they, they enjoy it and they learn. You know, it's just learning, smiling or something like this. Okay. So. That would be a little bit of the art workshops that you see how complex they end up being. Very, very complex. But we also do these intercultural encounters. And when we are, going, we are talking about intercultural relationships, we cannot continue thinking that inter intercultural means indigenous people, mestizo people, or Spanish-speaking people in our case, right? No, it is also indigenous to indigenous. So we do this, like in this case, where um, two, three different indigenous nations come together to work on the mapping, okay? Or this one, where indigenous people that are now living in Galapagos come together with people that are still in the continent to talk about their problems and their issues and everything. Or when we invite people from the highlands to visit Amazonia or to go up to the north, to the coast. Many, many of these people have never been out of their community. So there's an opportunity for them to speak in different languages, to learn about their own traditions and so on. Okay. Also, we do intercultural encounters in the city. So we bring all this material in giant form for people to play and learn about indigenous people and about themselves in multilingual international schools and also in schools where people with different capacities are. And thanks to that, we also create specific materials for everybody. Oops, you need to give me five minutes, please. So I go to my very last one, which is the Andean voices and the ethnographic lexicons. We talked a little bit about this, where we told you that the idea is to retrieve our ancestral knowledge about disease and treatments and so on and so forth. As usual, we go to the community, agree with this, and then do the training sessions. And pretty much this is the way this lexicon looks in the Lexic Pro, in the Lexic Pro program software, okay? And um, can we see this for like 30 minutes, maybe 30 seconds, two seconds, 10 seconds? Yeah, somebody was asking yesterday, how can I hear the way they talk? What do they say? 
we cannot hear. But it, there is this lady talking about the way she uses the plants, how she uses it. Let's, thank you very much. Let's continue. Okay, so fortunately right now I tell, um, I'm going to tell you we're very, very happy to see our printed version is pretty ready. It's a bilingual version in Quechua in Spanish. Don't talk about the standardized alphabet, please. <laughs> That's been a mess. And also, it's going to be in our web page. For now, it's just with PDF. But now, but, but it's going to have a different formatting so that we are able to link each one of the plants with the sound and the visuals. Okay? And we have done, uh, whoops, we have done some nice cards that I can give to you afterwards where we have some of the plants with the uses in Quechua, Spanish, and English. Okay? And people are very happy to go to this very fancy offices, official offices, and hand them in. You know, it's like, it's a trilingual picture of our plant. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Okay. And we have done something else for the public in general. It takes 30 seconds. Please. <laughs> These capsules are in different languages, and the idea is that we just pass them over and over again everywhere we go, indigenous communities and non-indigenous communities, and then everybody does what many of you have been doing, including myself. You know. Okay, so um, I already told you yesterday, I think, that one of the things is that many of these people working in this project have been coming to universities teaching our students and professors at the university how to use new software for language re revitalization, but for any purposes. This includes subtitles, okay? They have even, they've been in the United States already. And because of all this and all the media, we have got in touch with people, indigenous people who are now abroad especially in this case, the United States, New York, and because they have a live program on the radio, they are really seriously thinking about podcast. Okay, so long-term outcomes, I'm not gonna say it again because I don't even have the time, but it's a way of retrieving our history, bringing back our ancestral knowledge, being proud of who we are, right? And regaining self-recognition in what they say self-powerment, not empowerment, self-powerment. Okay. Most of this is going to be in our Linguistic Corpus webpage that is just a baby, baby born, where we're going to have Spanish and different varieties, but also indigenous languages, little by little. We, we have no money at all, so we're looking for volunteers. We are always looking for volunteers, just in case. And the last two things. We are always thinking how, how can we really work for the local, at the local level and answer our needs. And we had this wonderful surprise when this year a group of indigenous people from the northern part of, of Ecuador came to us asking, we need to think about our a language policy that really responds to our needs. We're becoming bilingual. We need to do something else. But we want to think and write a linguistic policy that brings the people's opinion and desires. This is brand new. And that was wonderful because that was their demand to the university and to the team to the Oralidad Modernidad team. Like we went, 
I paralyzed. It's like, oh my God. But we should do it. So then, in that way, we are going to respond in a different way to what they really think they need. Okay? So this is the university, my little office, you know, many people in the office discussing this with one of the authorities at the university. Hopefully, this is going to work, and we'll get it. I don't know. So you remember this? We work from the heart of the community to go back to the community and then to try to impact on the rest of the, the society. That's a very slow, expensive process. We are patients. We are very poor, too. There is no way we can just go everywhere. But I really think that what happened in this last step I just talked to you really shows how it, this efforts to revitalize the language come from the community to go back to the community. And we don't have the time to see this, so we don't have the time to see this either. I just want to thank you very much. Muli ipasalamatan natin si Dr. Habound para sa kanyang pagbabahagi ng mga inisyatiba nila sa Ecuador uh, sa pagsasalikop ng mga tradisyonal na pamamaraan at mga moderno sa pagsangguni sa kairaming mga individual. Sa lahat ng ito ay napakagandang marinig na sila ay nagsisimula sa komunidad para rin sa komunidad. The talk of uh, Dr. Harley Habound will be followed by Dr. Brandon Fairbanks of University of uh, Minnesota. Let's all welcome him. All right, you guys ready to do some more calisthenics? All right, Megwa, Megwa Nama Dabieg, Gego Buzigui Kegon, Gego, Gego Buzigui Kegon, Gego, Megwa, Megwa Nama Dabieg, Wa Ji Big, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, how in the page in the patch, yeah, Ji Big, oh, way, way, be quainig, way, way, be quainig, eh, wah, oh, Woo, me, 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 Nick, me, Gwetch. You guys feel good, all right? Feel good? All right. All right, well, let's get started. Um, I just wanted to say, I uh, wanted to start off, um, uh, you know, just listening to the other uh, presentations, I just wanted to say that my journey in language revitalization was really started off with a selfish reason. I really didn't start off to save any language, to save anything. I just wanted to learn my language because I don't, you know, for as an Ojibwe Kickapoo tribal member, it's very, uh, very difficult when you grow up and nobody has given you your language. Nobody spoke to you. And so what happens is you have this really big gaping hole in your identity. And it's a, it's, there's a lot of shame in that. So, um, so, cause it's very difficult to, someone says, oh, you're Ojibwe, do you speak Ojibwe? And you say, and you have to say no. Oh, you're Kickapoo? And they ask you, do you speak Kickapoo? I have to say no. And, but in answering that is a lot of shame, right? So, so learning Ojibwe, learning my own language was not to save it. But it was really to save me because it's very difficult to go through life and not know who you are, right? To not know who your people are. It's a very difficult thing to do. And, um, but having learned Ojibwe and be able to speak it, now I'm not perfect at it, but I'm able to speak to the elders. I speak to my friends in Ojibwe all the time. I text in Ojibwe. I, th I think in Ojibwe. I dream in Ojibwe. And it really has made me feel good about who I am. So my, my personal identity is fixed. <laughs> I don't know if it's fixed, but it's, you know, we're good. I'm doing good. 
Um, but now, I'm, ever since then, I've become a linguist. I went to school um, to be a linguist, to, to learn academic linguistics, um, because I felt that would help me to learn my own language. I didn't go into it thinking I'm going to help anybody else. I didn't care about anybody else. I just cared about my own identity as an Ojibwe Kickapoo and that I was going to learn my own language. But um, having learned it and learning linguistics has really helped me to understand the language and be able to help my fellow natives, my fellow Ojibwe's, to learn their language too. Uh, now, I used to be an immersion teacher. I did that too. So I'm not just a linguist. And, and what I do is is not real common as a as an indigenous person as a linguist who's doing research on my own language i'm usually linguists they do research on the language they get a day a data set they they take it to a conference and they present it on a screen for other linguists and i do that too and there's value in that because linguists they're smart people. They, they can pick apart your language and understand how it works, and they can't even speak it. So there's incredible value in, in linguistics and having the linguistics training to look at your own language. Um, but as part of that, um, I was an immersion teacher for preschool kids. And that's me. We're doing Itsy Bitsy Spider. Incidentally, I didn't know that. I didn't know it when I was an immersion teacher. Um, they told us before class, oh, you're going to teach the kids Eats a Bitsy Spider in Ojibwe. I didn't know it myself, so one of my uh, co-workers had to teach me Eats a Bitsy Spider and all the sign language, and it had to make up the song on the spot. Um, so this is some of our kids, and this was, the, this was the elder that I worked with who was in our room with us. And these are our kids, our preschool kids, and this was our our helper, she didn't really speak Ojibwe that much, but she had the license to be in the classroom. I, who was the Ojibwe speaker, well, she was the Ojibwe, she's the native speaker, second language learner. Um, now, I thought that when I got put into a classroom, I thought that, I don't know why I thought this, but I thought that she would run the class. <laughs> and, um, and I thought she would run the class. And, I, and the, first, uh, the first day we had class, I, did, I ran the class, I did circle time, we had fun, sang some songs. At the end of the day, I said, okay, whose turn is it tomorrow to run class? And both of them looked at me like, you are. <laughs> You're running class. So I'm like, okay, then I realized, oh, I'm, this is my class, and they're helping me. So, all right, and... This was, this was our other immersion teachers. We had uh, Ojibwe and Dakota in this immersion program. So we have some Dakota immersion teachers along with, uh, she was a, she's a Dakota native speaker, and she spoke both Ojibwe and Potawatomi. Uh, the rest of us were second language learners, and we were immersion teachers. Uh, this was with my preschool kids. I was teaching them how to point with their lips not kiss. I wasn't teaching them how to kiss. So in Ojibwe, it's, it's, in a lot of cultures in the world, it's really rude to do this, right? Like I'm doing this to you now. <laughs> in Ojibwe, it's not really polite to point to people because the, the idea is when you point to somebody, it could be something sacred that you're pointing at. It's disrespectful. So we use our lips. So if you want to say, oh yeah, where's, where's so-and-so? Oh, it would be. It would be. Right? We're not blowing kisses at you. We're going, it over there. Right? I don't know if you guys point with your lips. Do you point with your lips? I thought, it, I thought it was just us. So all this time, I thought you guys were blowing kisses at me. All right. Well, maybe some. Hey. <laughs> anyway, so this was back in my immersion teacher days. So I was a graduate student in linguistics at the time. So I was learning Ojibwe from the elders. I was teaching the little kids in the classroom. And then I was learning linguistics at the, in the, in the uh, classroom. Okay, so today what I wanted to talk about are language, adult language learners. Okay, I'm not going to talk about kids. We, um, as adult language, I don't know how many of you in here right now are 
don't know your, your native language, your heritage language. So let's say if you're part of a tribe here in the Philippines and you don't know it yet, raise your hand if that's, that fits your context, like you want to learn your tribal language. Raise your hand if that's you. You want to learn your tribal language. So you don't know your tribal language yet. But there are elders out there or native speakers who speak it, but you don't know it. Okay, so she wants, she's one, right? Anybody else who's in that position? No? Okay. Just one. Well, <laughs> or they don't want to raise their hand. <laughs> well, uh, what, what I've noticed, um, I wanted to talk about as language learners, in, in Minnesota, we have a community of language learners who are successful. What that means is uh, we figured out a way as adults to learn our language and be able to speak it fluently. When I say fluently, we're not native speakers fluent. We're second language speaker fluency, high proficiency. We can use the language, we can speak it, we can talk it all day long, but we're still learning. But some of us we kind of get like, man, you can't correct me. I know the language now, right? I call this the untouchable syndrome, right? We get to the point, these are adult language learners. This, like, this occurs in this context where, where we have a, a language learner community, and some of them get to, get to a point where they can speak it pretty good, but the problem is we think that we're done. After we can communicate and learn everything that's written in books, we kind of get this untouchable syndrome. And you can't correct them either. I corrected, we, me and that elder, we were going over the books that one of the other immersion teachers translated. And we, they asked us to look at it and make corrections, and we did. Because he, what he translated was, he wanted to translate, they ate an ice cream cone. What he said, though, in Ojibwe was, they crapped on an ice cream cone. And we had to change it. We had to change it because that was in a children's book. But when he found out we changed it, he doesn't like me anymore. He doesn't talk to me. He doesn't like me. So, but see, he got to this point where he thought, I'm uncorrectable. I know everything in the language now, right? So that's what I call the untouchable syndrome. It happens, right? Um, so we, but as language learners, as second language learners, we kind of plateau. We plateau. We stop noticing things. I notice in our community, and I don't know if this is true for every language learner community, but in our community, if they've reached a certain level of proficiency, they kind of uh, stop noticing new things from the, from the native speakers. And so, and so the tendency also is for our Ojibwe to start being Englishy. In other words, um, we, start to, we can start to speak Ojibwe that are Ojibwe words on top of English, le, uh, English words. And so the native speakers, the, the elders, can tell when someone speaks this way, they can tell, oh, they're speaking Ojibwe, but they're thinking in English, right? Okay. And maybe that's inevitable. That's, and we know in language learning across the world, that's probably a little bit inevitable. That that's, kind of goes with the territory. Um, so as, as language learners, if you're an adult and you're trying to learn your tribal language, the, the, there's a paradox we as the language learners, we don't know what we don't know. We don't know what we don't know. The native speakers don't know what they do know, right? As language, as native speakers now of Tagalog or Filipino or whatever language you speak or English, you're largely not aware of your own language, right? Um, and you're probably not aware of that fact, right? Um, so as language learners, we have to stay vigilant to the differences between language learner speech and native speaker speech. Um, we cannot stop, as language learners, we can't stop noticing new things, new grammar patterns and words that the native speakers are using. And we must always strive to produce language which approximates the speech of native speakers. Okay, so this is really an advanced, whew, maybe a little bit of an esoteric um, if, you're, if you're not a language learner of your tribal language yet, it may, this may not make a lot of sense to you yet. Um, so, but in our community, um, well, I wanted to talk about today about what's, what has been, 
what's called an emergent language. And this has various definitions depending on which context you're using it in. The, um, but I, the definition that I'm using, my working definition for what I'm talking about today is the language that may be created by the language learners in pursuit of learning the target language. Okay, so here, our, language, our target language is Ojibwe. We want to learn Ojibwe. But sometimes the language that the language learning community creates is this emergent Ojibwe language. And it, it can resemble the, the, the actual native language, but in this emergent Ojibwe language can resemble, have a lot of Englishy type tendencies, English word order, um, the, but also the loss of certain Ojibwe or uh, syntactic things or a loss of a lot of uh, details in the language that go unnoticed. So I'll give you all, I know this is kind of dense. I don't know if this is really resonating with you guys or not, but I'll give you, I'll give you an idea. So it's going to get very linguistic-y right now, okay? So bear with me. Um, one case is the, the, the concept of after. Every language in the world seems to have a way of saying after, right? You're thinking right now in Tagalog, oh, how would I say after he left, after I eat? You have a way, right? In Spanish, in English. All right, so now it turns out, now English has this word after. It's very convenient. In Ojibwe, there is no word for after, okay? There is no single word. Now, there's a way to... to, to to instantiate the concept, but there's no word for it. But our language learners have, have taken this word here, that means stop, this word ishqua, and have labeled it as being equivalent to the English after. Okay? So this becomes, but, but what it really means is stop. Okay? Uh, all right. Getting very linguistic-y. Okay, so this is how we know that ishqua means stop and not after per se. Okay, so you look at the word, first word, ishqua, ta, ishqua ta. Here she stops an activity. Ishqua, give me one. It stops raining. Ishqua minikwe, he has stopped drinking. Right, so it's pretty clear. And then here's a sentence here. Gishpin ishqua wisinian, gidani gaimen. If you stop eating, like if you go on a hunger strike or something, I don't know. If you stop eating, you'll, you'll make us sorry, right? So here's an example of ishkwaz, meaning stop. Now, so the language learners, though, have labeled ishkwa. So now, if you ask any Ojibwe language learner how to say after an Ojibwe, they'll tell you ishkwa, right? But I've been on this crusade. Based on my research, I go out to the community and say, look... You think it means just after, but it doesn't mean exactly what you think it means. And you're using it, and it's o you're overproducing. Okay? So here's an example here. This is why, pr presumably, why Ishkwa got labeled as after. So if we look at the first example, Ishkwa Zaga Aman, Gizi Bikin in Jean. After you go to the bathroom, wash your hands. I used to tell my kids this all the time in the preschool classroom. Right? But you can tell where it occurs. In the English translation, it kind of occurs in the same spot, right? So the language learners all of a sudden think, oh, okay, that's the part that means after. But really, what you're really saying literally is saying when you stop going to the bathroom or when you're done going to the bathroom, wash your hands. So that's really what the Ojibwe is saying, okay? Um, so you, it's easy to see why Ishqua got labeled that by language learners. Um, okay, so this is, this is the language learner rule. I call it Ojibwe 1.0. Okay, one, Ojibwe 1.0. This is the one, Ojibwe 1.0 or the emergent language rule that gets taught all across Ojibwe country. Minnesota, Wisconsin, Ontario, everywhere. This rule gets taught. Gi Ishqua Majad. You use it like this. Um, when we call this a conjunct verb, I know that means nothing to you, but the form of the verb is important. So you use a schwa with a certain form of the verb, and you'll get, in English, an after sentence. Okay. But here's the native speaker pattern. Notice we use the word for maja, for left, leave. 
The native speaker pattern, though, is gama jat. There's no ishqua. That's the native speaker pattern, gama jat. So, but it still means, right, the meaning of gama jat, right, still means after she left, when she left, as soon as she left. Okay? All right. Ojibwe 2.0, the upgrade. And this is, this is based on my, my own research and other research from other linguists. Um, so if you want to say something, but you got, uh, so the first sentence here, guy squaw we sent it. After she got done eating, she left. And then if you look at this sentence here, the second one, after she kissed him, she ran away. So you notice that these are both after sentences, after they use the, in English anyways. They instantiate the meaning of after, but in the first case, there's the use of ishqua. The second sentence, there is no ishqua. But they both still instantiate this concept of after. Okay, so you got to ask, all right, what's going on then? Why is it here you use ishqua and you don't use ishqua here, right? Well, the answer turns, turns out to be that it's, that it's really what's going on here. Let me see if I got... It's this process of initial change, we call it. Initial change on the verb is a part that instantiates the meaning of after, not the pre-verbal unit ishqua. Okay, so for example, when we say initial change, we take a form like here. So when we take this sentence here, bidda go shanan. So the verb here is arrive. So in the bi means come. So bidda go shanan, when you get home. But if you, if you do initial change on bi, bidda go shanan, then this means after you got home or when you got home, right? So, so and there's no ishqua in here. So ishqua has really nothing to do with it. Um, but the reason why ishqua is used sometimes is that the rule I always tell my students is if you can do it all day long, you need to stop preverb ishqua, okay? Um, but we're verbs like dagoshin, like arriving, Find those those don't need to be stopped. Those are over in an instant. So they're instantaneous. Okay So so the goal here that of what I do anyways my goal as a linguist as an indigenous linguist as an Ojibwe linguist is To do the linguistic research in order to more fully understand the language and the more subtle aspects of the language because the subtle aspects that are very difficult to get at Especially if you don't have those processes in English or your native language or whatever. And we want to try to minimize. Now, I'm not, naive, I'm not, not so naive to think that we're going to completely avoid an emergent language. So that's, okay, that's off the table. I realize that. But we want to minimize, right, the creation of an emergent language that's so emergent that it looks like English, right? Um, because after I've done the research on Ojibwe language, after doing a lot of research, I realized there are a lot of beautiful processes and thought processes going on in the language that in, the English language cannot inform you on, right? So there might be uh, aspects of your own native language, and when you try to learn your tribal language, your native language will not inform you on some of those processes in the target language. Okay, so, all right, so we want to minimize um, and there's a lot of talk these days about decolonization or whatever. I usually don't use that term very much. Really, I just want, I don't want to lose the good stuff is my point. In the, in the, cause if to me, Ojibwe is a beautiful language and I don't want to lose the native speaker mindset, the native speaker, how they see the world just to, and plus when I give to my children, I don't want to give my children a language that largely looks like English. Right, because there's so many beautiful things in the language that I would love to preserve. We're not going to get it all. I get that. Okay, and and also we want to do the research in order to help our language learners, our students, our an adult language students, to approximate the speech of native speakers, so that we do not create language that is fundamentally based on English, but that 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 the language is not doesn't sound like English in our context. That the, that's our native language. We don't want 
Ojibwe to sound like English, right? So part of the, the, uh, the goal is to do that. Um, okay, well, that's all I have for that. I, thank you. I don't know if that's helpful or not, but thank you. Maraming salamat, Dr. Fairbanks, para sa inyong uh, pagbabahagi tungkol sa halaga ng pananaliksik, panlingwistika, no sa daigdig ng uh, wika at kultura, no higit lalo sa pag-iiba ng isang tiyak na wika sa tinatawag nating source language o yung typical na mga ginagamit na intelektualisadong wikang kagaya ng Ingles. At this moment, ladies and gentlemen, once again, we will invite Dr. Heinrich here in front to give his reaction to Dr. Habon and Dr. Fairbanks' talks. Warm of applause, please. Round of applause. Thank you very much. Um, this was um, interesting. Um, it's inspiring. Um, I admire uh, the energy that goes into your work. I admire the results uh, you have produced. I admire the effects um, it has on people. So it's a, it's a real uh, honor, you know, to, to uh, comment that. And um, I'll do that just trying to link what you said with some of the things I pointed out, because I think, you know, in, in that way, uh, we create really a panel where, you know, each presentation or the, the whole panel is more than the part of his sums. Um, with Marlene, I thought at the start, <clears throat> um, there's various people, you know, um, involved in language revitalization and there's uh, conflicting interests. We have uh, institutions of the state, of the regions, we have minorities themselves, and they very often want something different. You know, what uh, do institutions know, want, what does the government want, what does uh, policies aim at, and what do, do minorities really want? What do they really want? It's not that easy to find out because um, you need to, to stop and you know to, you know, to start thinking, deeply thinking about this. Um, Most people are other people. Most people just repeat what they have heard. You know, most people don't really go inside and say, let's start from scratch. You know, what is really at hand? But there's, you know, there's discourse out there. And people are using bits and pieces of that. And when you talk with them, you find out, you know, and we listen to them. And we take time to listen to them and we think about it. You very, find, very often find out that it's not coherent or that's, well, not coherent, it's too strong. It's contradictory. You know, they would say something and then something else and they behave in a different way. So it's very important for us to, to analyze this, what is going on. And um, I, I think your, um, your project um, addresses this straight on in um, asking them, you know, for their own stories, for their own voices. Um, to give them the opportunity, not just to write something, produce something in their language, but to reflect um, on it. And we also saw, you know, uh, coincidentally, we saw exactly the same kind of approach in Thailand, right? That uh, people write down their stories and you encourage them because you find out that they were interested in what you were doing, namely you were writing down field notes, you were doing the stuff, and they want to do that as well. So that is, you know, such a, a, a sharp observation, such a good ethnographic eye to say, you know, they want to do the same on their thing. So that is, this is really, really important um, and something to be, to be followed by everyone working in an endangered um, community. Um, <clears throat> when I did that, you know, I was sometimes 
Well, first of all, I did not create all the words you did. And I sometimes find myself that I was uh, impatient. You know, I was l listening to these stories and I thought, well, I've heard that before. And I thought, you know, that's contradictory. And um, it kept being repetitive. And sometimes I was unhappy with the stuff that people were telling me. Um, well, the Japanese novelist Murakami Haru, uh, Haru, uh, Harumi once said, um, what we know is the sum of our mistakes. So you make you know, enough mistakes and then the penny finally drops. Um, the penny that dropped on me is that this uh, discourse that um, indigenous people are telling us is not factual discourse that we scholars are after. You know, it's not like what has happened, when and why, and you know, how can we fit that in a model. Um, it, it has to do with healing. They're trying to rationalize what has happened to them. So there's um, a discourse where they're trying to come to grips with uh, what we cannot understand as not indigenous people, uh, real psychological trouble identity trouble, um, stigma. Um, it's, it's very touching to um, see these little children who at one point and very early on will discover that their parents are not respected by some people. That they will find out that what they take as natural, they see culture as natural and as obvious, is looked down upon. And they go through this when they're four, five, six, they become aware of this. So this is a burden on people, you know? And when they talk, you know, they talk about this. Somehow come to grips to that. And I myself look back when I did the first interviews as a deeply silly scholar, trying to look how all of that fits into a, a scholarly scheme, how that relates you know, to something factual, to something that I could measure and quantify and me being impatient with that was just, you know, very, very poor field work. And let not anybody fall into this trap, you know? Even if it's not the kind of stuff that you go and, you know, sell at a conference and publish in a journal, this is really, really important for them. And having that outlet is just as important, I think, as the language itself. And it's probably something that we call decolonization. You know, you need to talk that. You need to get that off your chest. And so this is... Um, a, a, great, uh, a great activity, I think, because not only you produce something, you know, you, you help to come over the, the, the problem. Um, and what I thought about it in both uh, presentations, and we're not talking about it at all in this um, symposium, that language endangerment, language shift, language revitalization has a deep psychological uh, tie. You know, it's, I mean, there's real trauma uh, behind it and having to go through that. It's really unsettling. Um, let me tell you just one little example. As you know, I'm not indigenous, but I was once uh, put into a situation where I had to make a very important language choice. And that language choice was uh, when uh, my daughter was born. We were living in, um, we were living in Japan at the time. And um, my wife, of course, you know, being very, very Italian, decided I will talk Italian to our daughter. And I'm bilingual French and German, um, but we lived in Japan, and you know, she would pick up Japanese. And I thought, well, what would she do with French or German? You know? And I thought, well, I'll, I'll, I'll speak English to her. You know, I'll speak English to her, you speak Italian, and she will learn um, Japanese. And then there were complications during the birth. So my wife had to be operated, there was a cesarean cut. And she was like, you know, in the, you know, basically gone, you know, knocked out. And I was there with a newborn daughter, you know, still, you know, bloodied and crying her heart out, you know, because she had no idea where she was. And so as a father, you know, you, you did what you do. I put my hands on her and I started talking to her in German. <laughs> There's just no way in that situation where you want to calm down, where you just say, don't worry, you know, I said to her, don't worry, it's okay, it's me, dad. Saying that in a foreign language, you know, you understand, you know, how difficult that is. And in language endangerment, people have taken that choice, they've done that. So imagine 
how difficult that is to cut that tie. So there's a real psychological issue in language endangerment that, you know, I, I think we need to address in, in symposium, in research. So that is another topic. And I saw that, you know, in both talks, you know, that link was very, very obvious. You know, in these stories, um, and children are probably a good point to, to start with because children are all inspiring in their energy, uh, how relentless they are, how courageous they are in tackling new things, right? So that's probably a very, very good uh, age to start with. Um, and um, since you both uh, had this element, you know, of working with very, very small children, I thought that's a very good idea. It becomes much more difficult, I think, um, the older you get. Um, and when I said, you know, I started out, you know, what do institutions want? What does this government want? What, does, what do minorities really want? From there raised the third uh, question, it's very important. How do we position ourselves as academics? You know, it's too easy to just say, to take the laissez-faire starts to say, well, I'll just do the research, but that's it. You know, I'm, you know, I'm not involved, I'm a scholar kind of stuff. You know, laissez-faire is siding with the strong. You know, laissez-faire means, uh, you know, approving of domination. That's what it boils down to. You know, it boils down to uh, siding with people uh, imposing, you know, terms of contact based on inequality, on power, on domination. So uh, as scholars, we need certain values. We've never talked about that, right? I mean, we talked about research ethics and stuff like that. But us, you know, what is our position, you know, as, as uh, people in humanities, right? Like every doctor has like, you know, certain ethic of the contact stuff. We, we should need something like that as well. And I think we should cite diversity, uh, egality, cultural freedom, solidarity, and you know, and, and I, I thought that was very, very present um, in your work. So you know, it's it's um, very inspiring um, to see that um, you have, you know, both of you have clearly achieved so much, and um, that is important as well. It's not just enough, you know, to have the right attitudes to go out there to be a bit smarter than I was when I started out, you know, to really listen to the stories and think about that and sometimes drop your, you know, the, the categories and the concepts and the theory that you take in the field. Um, you need to create success because success will align more people. You know, if you work on indigenous communities in indigenous language, indigenous language education, you will always have to be better than the majority system, than the majority institutions. You know, and most often it is. Most often it is doing that. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, because you can start from scratch, you know. You don't, you're not working in an old system with like strange attitudes, you know, towards diversity, ambiguity, and all that kind of stuff. So you can start from scratch and you can start where people really are and not some, you know, preconceived notions what education ought to be, which stem from the, you know, the period of nation building, um, basically. But it's very, very important. You know, it's not easy. Anyone engaging that will have to be very, very good. And, uh, but it's fun to be good, right? There's something, there's something uh, uh, which, makes, which makes you feel good about yourself, uh, which is, uh, which draws more people into this uh, into these projects, and uh, you'd probably you know maybe when you discuss this you know m maybe you could talk you know how other people have aligned to this project. You talked about uh, um, you know lack of funding and voluntary work. So voluntary work only happens when there's quality and uh, when you are doing well. And I'd also like you know maybe uh, Brendan could talk about that you know. Um, what kind of group is there around? What kind of uh, dynamics is there around? What kind of support um, do you get very often unexpectedly? Um, I think that is um, something important to understand um, that we are in a situation where we have to be excellent. 
There's no way you can revitalize a language. There's no way you can engage in something. There's no way you can align people by being average. You know, you need to be very, very good. Um, with regards to, to Brandon and the linguistics part, um, I, I like that a lot because that is, a, that is a huge issue, you know, and we move away from psychology, you know, about which I think we all think, you know, we should engage in that, more into a, a terrain where we are familiar with. And um, that is indeed, you know, something that we need to discuss because there is a thin line between language purism you know, where you say, oh, if it's not, you know, like in that particular case, in that particular speech, we don't want to have it. And what we call verbal hygiene, that is to say, oh, come on, you know, that's, you know, we can do better than that, you know. There's a system there, and that system is lacking here, and that system has a place and a function, and, you know, it's doing things particularly well, kind of stuff. So, um, I wouldn't know, you know, wh how prominent that is actually in language revitalization. I think there's a real necessity also, you know, to take that great concept of verbal hygiene, where people say just discourse, you know, on, on cultivating language. That's what it's about, right? I mean, everybody I agrees that we have to cultivate English and Filipino and Italian, but you also have to cultivate uh, all endangered languages, you know? So anything goes is not a good approach. Uh, but language purism too, you know, will just drive people away. So that is um, something that we we need to talk about. Um, you will never be a native speaker, right? So um, we have to come to grips with that. You know, there are uh, many endangered languages will have to do with that, you know, uh, 1.0, 2.0 kind um, of version. And I think we can learn from um, the field of language cultivation. You know, what did people do when they cultivated French? What did people do when they cultivated Filipino? Well, they wrote. They wrote the language. They gave public speeches. They employed the language. And in so doing, they polished it. You know, that's probably the only way that we have um, in order to make sure, you know, that uh, the language that is used, you know, is systematic, it's functional, uh, and is not just, as you said, you know, English version of that, of that language. So just, you know, as a, as a final comment. And with that, uh, I'd like to stop here. Sorry for talking so much. <laughs> and um, looking forward, you know, to, uh, to the discussion. Thank you. Maraming salamat muli, Dr. Heinrich. Uh, sa puntong ito ay aaniyahan natin ang ating dalawa pang mga tagapagsalita na tumungo sa gitna at uh, sagutin ng mga tanong. Sa puntong ito ay bukas na ang ating bulwagan para sa inyong mga tanong at reaksyon. Mangyaring lumapit lamang po sa mikropono sa gitna, ipakilala ang sarili bago ihain ang tanong. Mic test. Okay, uh, my name uh, is Bert Ocampo from Philippine Normal University. I have two questions. Uh, the first one is directed to Dr. Fairbanks, and the other one is directed to Dr. Heinrich. Can you hear me? Hello. Okay. Okay, um, I'd like to, to ask Dr. Fairbanks in regard to, uh, to his acquisition or learning of, 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 of 
Ojibwe as his second language. Now, when you were learning this language, at what age did you start? Okay, because we have, as you know, everybody, everybody knows here probably about the age hypothesis issue. And uh, it seems though, although I don't know your language, the way you spoke it, I think you, I would classify you as, as like a near native uh, proficient of, of your second language. And when you were learning this language, uh, during what age and were you exposed when you were younger to in an environment where this this dialect or your lang or your native language was being spoken at home or in the community that's why uh, with that or in that regard you are actually doing or have attained a near native proficiency of the language I know uh, as Dr. Heinrich mentioned that nobody uh, I'd like to well disagree with what he said though that that you can never achieve nativeness or native proficiency of the language uh, you can comment on that all right uh, and then my question with dr. Ha Hamrick is in regard to honorifics okay you mentioned about gentry honorifics as well as the commoner honorific now I'm concerned that when you work on revitalization of any indigenous language uh, is there a room to the study or learning of of some words that are hateful words that are unpleasant uh, angry words for instance you know every everyday language or words that are spoken by by the commoners is there a room for that in revitalization or we just concentrate ourselves in the in the pleasant pleasant language or the pleasant terms or words that we usually do as a cultivated individual so what is your definition of uncultivated language and when I use for example four letter words will will this be part and parcel of revitalization program thank you okay <clears throat> yeah when I was growing up um, <clears throat> I didn't hear the language at all um, I think uh, my aunt named her dog Ikwe, which means woman, because I think it was a female dog. That's all I've heard. And maybe hello and thank you. That's all I heard growing up. And so I was about 18 years old, maybe, when I started to dabble in learning it. And it wasn't until, and I just read um, Ojibwe texts and stories and, and listened to audio recordings and kind of was teaching myself. And then, um, and then when I got an, a linguistic uh, knowledge, a, a linguistic ca capability, I started using that to teach myself uh, the language by reading it. And, but I started hanging out with the elders for about a seven year period. Once a week, I just he he um, spent time with the elders, pick, picking their brains and, um, and just interacting with them. And I was able to, and, to, and I, if you have the technical knowledge of linguistics, you, uh, well, at least in my case, I was able to use that um, to teach myself to a higher proficiency, whereas my friends of mine that would come with me to hang out with the elders, um, I'm teaching them now. It's, it's amazing how if you don't have the linguistic uh, techni technical skills, that the language learner comes away sometimes with less. They're not able to sometimes notice or uh, teach themselves the language. So, so, you know, so technically, when it comes to syntax, phonology, and when I was hanging out with the elders, I was listening to everything they were saying. I would record it. I would write down things, write down phrases. I would note the context. And I still have those notes today. And I use that. And because they will never come out and say, hey, Brendan, do you know how, do you know how to say this? They'll never say that. I had to listen to their patterns. And when I noticed the patterns 
and it was replicated time and time again, I knew that it was, that's a pattern of the language that I can use for myself. So I was constantly stealing their patterns from them. I wasn't stealing. I was, well, you know what I mean. So, um, so and I'm still learning, still learning. It's not perfect. And um, so I, I'm not sure if that answered your question, but that's basically my, my journey. Um, I, I try to be brief with, um, with my answer. Um, first of all, um, how do we choose that? Well, you see what uh, works in the communities. So there's altogether um, 70 populated islands in the Ryukyu Islands. There's six different languages with uh, 750 different dialects. And we find out that between communities, things work differently. You know, the speakers react differently. Uh, some insist on honorifics being used, otherwise they would not talk to you, they would not reply. Other people adapt to the new speakers. And so, you know, uh, some of the honorifics uh, go away. Um, I did not want to uh, oppose or allude to a, um, a binary between cultivated language, uncultivated language, um, but what you often have in language shift is that a language very often survives in particular speech acts which include swearing, shouting, being angry, telling jokes, right? So this is not very, very prestigious and it's not that kind of stuff that you can then take and bring to school and revitalize the language on, right? And <clears throat> so you have to look, you know, for users before the language got so marginalized to these functions, you know, and um, then you'd find out that some social acts or some regional dialects of these languages have more on offer because they were used differently. I mean, these are um, languages of an agrarian society where there was no uh, mobility whatsoever. So it was just used to speak among peers, usually these dialects. But for the Shuri dialect, which was used, you know, for all kinds of performing arts, for writing kind of stuff. So if you want to take the language and adapt it to the present day, you know, you find that that language has a lot of material that is helpful. And so um, this is uh, why you have the pattern that people in Shuri Naha, in this uh, city, are choosing that particular kind of variety. But you have uh, people in uh, some islands, smaller islands, very nearby Okinawa, uh, who are going in another direction. They're using the commoner variety to revitalize, you know, their own local speech. Po, sa mga susunod na magtatanong, uh, gawing tiyak lamang at maikli ang pagtatanong ng sa gayon ay higit na mahaba ang oras para sa pagsagot. Sige po. May apagapana, ay abak po. Um, my name is Joy Cruz. I'm the Heritage, Culture and Arts Officer of Angeles City, Pampanga. Um, first of all, I'd like to say that um, the presentations today resonated with me very well. Um, Kapampangan, our language, has two million speakers, and yet um, the measure of UNESCO is not with the number of speakers, but by the level of uh, speakers. So right now, the, parental, uh, the speakers are of parental age and are not passing the language to their children. Um, I, for one, I'm guilty. This is my job, and yet my own children do not speak the language. And um, our mayor, our vice mayor, saw that. And so we took steps, um, and we, uh, we created a law last year uh, in safeguarding the language. Um, maybe this is because for so many reasons, but maybe they, this is because consciously or unconsciously, um, I was, many of us, schools during my time um, penalized speaking in Kapampangan. You had to pay one peso for every word that you uttered in Kapampangan, aside from the humiliation that you'll be getting. So I think uh, we do not want to our children to experience that, that's why we we don't want them to speak in Kapampangan right now. Uh, 
But then, again, we're taking steps. My question is, um, um, we are confronted with guests, um, immigrants, who are not speaking the language. Uh, we want to implement our law, but then we have to uh, adapt or to adjust to them. My question, um, how do you balance culture and enforcing or safeguarding your language? When I say culture, like hospitality, uh, we've seen this to, uh, in the past three days. We always, Filipinos always try to accommodate or are very apologetic when talking to people who do not speak the language. Um, so, uh, my context in my city, um, we are a pop uh, our population is 500,000, but during the daytime, our population uh, goes up to 1 million because of uh, those who are studying, who are working there and having business. So every day we are bombarded with people who do not speak the language. So do we enforce them to learn the language while they're there? Or do we still have to be hospitable? And that's, that's what we're seeing every day. Uh, people are saying that no, we must be hospitable to the guests. Thank you. Um, that's a social linguistic topic, so I quickly um, say something on that. Um, the phenomenon we are talking about is called uh, language adaptation. So we know that people in contact, uh, you know, one people will, no, language accommodation, sorry, language accommodation, that one person will accommodate um, the other. So if you over accommodate, you do damage, right? So uh, I would encourage you, you know, don't link um, hospitality with accommodation. The two, the two things are not linked to one another. You know, you can be hospital and insist um, on not accommodating. Um, the people. I mean, this is your community, this is your town, this is your city. You live there 24 hours, you've always been there. Um, you, you should not accommodate. Um, when it comes to language shift and uh, language loss of parents, um, look, I'm not in favor of um, continuing telling people what they should do, what they should not do. Right? Language shift started from people running around and telling people, you know, speak Tagalog, speak standard Japanese, speak this, speak that. And once they do, you know, come in a, a new group of linguists and say, no, we were wrong, please use your language. So um, the task is rather, you know, to create a situation where it's easier, you know, to, to uh, pass on the languages. Sometimes, you know, if people have been exposed to these situations that have been made ashamed of it, you know, this is deeply ingrained. This is very, very difficult to overcome. Language attitudes, attitudes in general that you have, you know, are very, very stable. Um, very often what, what works, what I see works in the Ryukyus is if, if you jump one generation, because there's somehow the link established, you know, to the parents' children, but the grandparents might talk to the grandchildren. Um, so sometimes once you are in that pattern, you know, it's very, very difficult to change. Because the personal relationship is based on that particular language. So, you know, the friendship, the familiarity is based on that language. And moving into another language damages the relation between them. That's not at all easy to do. You know, that's like the, the initial thing that you have. Oh, that was wrong. Let's change the language. Very, very difficult to do. And I, I don't like the idea of prescribing and prescribing, prescribing whenever attitudes change. Right? So maybe find something you know, uh, more subtle to do that, you know, more alluding to do that would, would, would be my uh, suggestion. Well, not much more, but um, about the migration, I mean, I think that's just happening everywhere. And um, it's so nice to see and to stay with you guys that are so nice and gentle and caring. But still, I see you keep on speaking your language, and, and that's wonderful because then the foreigners start feeling guilty. I, I felt guilty even when I was looking at Manila and then Manila with a Y, and, and the desire to learn something, at least the, 
the basics like saying salamat or salamat with the wrong intonation and accent, it, it helps you become part of the community. So what you're telling, telling us about your town, it happens in, in all our towns, really and truly, and in many indigenous communities now that more foreigners come and then they are so worried about learning English or speaking Spanish in a very nice way. But I think the more people get to be proud of their language and their ancestral language and talk to foreigners maybe in their language and try to accommodate for a while, foreigners should learn that the language in such a place where they have decided to stay or leave should be the language they need to start learning. Even for little things. Um, in some of the indigenous communities where I work, uh, they started to have this indigenous local tourism, ecological tourism, whatever name we give to it. And at first they were trying to 100% accommodate to foreigners. Like, oh, there is these people coming from Europe and they want to have orange juice. So let's prepare orange juice for them to be happy. But it happens to be that they are cooking with fire in, in, in small hut in, in Amazonia, and the orange juice end up being smoky, and the foreigners complain. So these guys started to discuss this, and then they decided, well, if they are coming to us, they should learn what we do, how we live, how we talk, we'll try to help them with some little lessons about our language for them to know the basics. Of course, you cannot take every single migrant and foreigner to learn the language and lessons, but, but I think the more you speak your own language in front of foreigners, the more they are going to feel the need to learn it. It is the same with dialects. Right now there is a lot of, there, we have so many Colombian people in Ecuador and so many people from Venezuela. And Colombians and people from Venezuela always complain about how are we ugly highland Ecuadorian is, I mean Ecuadorian dialect is. It's like, oh, they speak so ugly, they eat so ugly, they are so ugly, they are so small, and so on and so forth. And there are some uh, YouTube videos when they're talking how, how ugly we are and we speak. And you know, more and more, I do see some of our young students trying to speak as if they were from Colombia or from Venezuela, and, or from Spain, because of the big migration of Ecuadorians in Spain going back and forth. So um, I really think this has to do with being proud of our own heritage and knowledge and the way we are and the way we talk. It doesn't mean not being nice to the others. So. I think it is difficult to combine, but, but we should, we should. Um, then talking about how we should teach our children, you know, there is always a difference between the way we talk at home and we talk in the community and, and the way we talk in school. All the more and more our young people can just use any kind of swearing words anytime, but it is a difference. And I do see with our indigenous peoples that because of all these prescriptions about speaking proper Quechua, speaking your proper language the way it is, how is it? You need to communicate with family and friends and you need to use your everyday language. You know, that, is, that has really damaged a lot of the intergeneral communication because the elders start to hear, oh, that's not the way I should pronounce this. Because my son told me it, it's a different way. And that's not the way I should use that word. So I better don't use the language. So all these prescriptions do not help to reinforce and revive our languages. We need to communicate. We have to communicate the way we speak in every specific situation, our home, our community, and so on. I just give you this very small example, and I pass it to you. Um, I was in this indigenous community up in the mountains, 
and I was talking to a little guy and I say, how do you call this? That was a car. And he said, Antawa. I say, is that Quichua? Yes, Antawa. And I said, really? Do you have any other word for car? No. Oh, say, somebody told me you should say carro from Spanish. Carro, carro, okay. So finally he goes, okay, I'm going to tell you the way it is. When I'm here with my family, I do say carro. But then when I go out, I need to say antawa because that is the proper standard word we're able to use in a school. So the grandparents and the parents say, now they are using this new word antawa, which I don't know. So really and truly, I'm not going to talk Kichwa to my children again because I am damaging his Kichwa. So I think we need to be very careful with that because being so prescriptive all the time is going, may damage communication. So we need to kind of separate the spaces when we speak how and who will, right? Okay. You want to say something? <laughs> All right, I'll keep it real short. I would just say um, if you're looking at the, uh, the death of your language, I would say you never need to apologize for speaking your language. Speak your language. Who, who cares what anybody else thinks, right? You might care a little, but if that means that your language is going to be used less and it's going to be endangered and it's going to die, to hell with everybody else. You have to speak your language. And, and I know that um, our situation was similar. The reason why our language became endangered because of the, um, largely because, well, there's a few factors, but boarding schools, a lot of our native youth were sent to boarding schools where they were not allowed to speak their native language. And if they spoke their native language, their mouth was washed out with soap, right? Instead of paying money, their mouth got washed out with soap or they were, they were spanked or they were punished. So a lot of their, those kids grew up and did not speak to their own kids in their native language because they didn't want their kids to suffer either. But um, so that's why uh, it's just, we share a similar uh, context. So I would say um, speak to your kids. If, you're, if you speak your native tongue, speak to your kids at home. It's really effective, right? So speak to them at home. Don't, don't, you don't need to apologize. You don't need anybody's permission. If you speak to your babies at home, they'll learn it. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Michael Walsh is next in line. Mr. Walsh will be followed by the gentleman at the back. All right, uh, all three talks were terrific, obviously, but I want to... So all three talks were terrific, but I wanted to react particularly to Patrick's uh, talk, especially on the psychological angle. So some years back, I attended a national meeting of Indigenous, Australian Indigenous people who were interested in their languages, maintaining them, reviving them, and so on. I was called into this meeting, and there was a fair bit of discussion uh, but most of it was essentially abusing linguists in general, and me in particular. Uh, so after a while I came out of the meeting and was uh, hanging around, and one of the guy, Aboriginal guys from inside came out and said, that was pretty rough, you know, you were really kicked around in there, and it's just not fair. And I said, don't worry about it. You know, people were just frustrated and letting off a bit of steam. But I'm mentioning this because although there is a, uh, a certain amount of literature now about um, non-Indigenous linguists working on endangered languages, there's a, another category that I would like to propose, which is not endangered languages, but endangered linguists. <laughs> now, I'm, uh, maybe this sounds funny, but 
Um, amongst other things, Indigenous people have said of linguists that uh, you come along, you collect stuff from our elders, write it up in a book and then become a millionaire. And I think, well, if I'm a millionaire, how come I've only got five pairs of shoes? Shouldn't I have 5,000 pairs, just as an example? But there is this kind of disconnect between some views in the Indigenous communities and what linguists do. Now, when I'm talking about endangered linguists, there's someone that I uh, was in touch with who was involved in reviving languages in the southeast of Australia. And she uh, mentioned to me a number of times that she received quite um, virulent feedback. She was abused, basically, by a whole lot of people. Now, my reaction to that stuff is, it doesn't really, I don't really care. I mean, I prefer people like me, but uh, if they want to uh, criticise me, that's okay. Because, uh, let's say, like Patrick and Marlene, I'm pretty tough. I can take it if people want to dish it out. But one woman in particular um, was increasingly disenchanted, uh, completed a PhD and said, I never want to do anything to do with indigenous languages or linguistics ever again in my life. So she's not just endangered, she's lost to the indigenous communities. So what I've sometimes said to groups of indigenous uh, people interested in preserving their languages is you need to try and preserve the linguists. Um, by all means, uh, you can insult me if you like, but some of the younger people, they're really going to take it to heart and they'll just lose the field. And she's not the only one who's left. One of the projects I'm working on in language revival involves a woman who um, was a professional linguist for years. She's now retired and I asked whether she wanted to become involved in the language revival project and she said, no, nah, I've retired, I've told the community I'm leaving it completely, I don't want to put up with any more aggravation. So that's the issue. Now it's hardly a question, but I guess, um, Patrick, uh, have you experienced this kind of uh, treatment and um, what's your reaction? Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, you, you, you're touching a, a very important um, topic here. Um, you know, when I went today into this talk, I uh, had decided myself, I made up my mind, and I thought, you know, uh, be calm and do not be emotional. Hmm. And I thought, you know, and, and I had to think, you know, why would I be emotional over these things? You know, I am emotional about these things. I am passionate about these things, but I thought, you know, there's all these indigenous people here. You know, they have all the rights to be emotional, right? What is happening to them, to their languages? You know, they have suffered. You know, I'm, I'm German, French, you know, uh, kind of stuff. Why am I emotional? And I, I, I had to think about that. And, you know, I somehow wanted to offer a calm perspective because that's, I think, what our job is. And you, you pointed that out, you know, our job is, you know, somehow be be strong, you know, take a position, be calm, point out that, you know, this is a good sound way to go about. But how comes we are emotional? And you pointed out why, we you know, because we get, you know, a bunch of abuse uh, out there. Uh, we are producing scholarship and turning out evidence after evidence after evidence just to find out that some people are so powerful they don't care about the stuff and just go with totally outmoded models, ideologies, perception kind of stuff. It makes you angry. And I personally um, stopped doing recurrent linguistics for seven years. I have just returned this year. I, I edited the handbook of recurrent linguistics, which was a nightmare because, you know, there was so much hostility into it, so many people trying to influence me, uh, people trying to stop the project, and so on, so on. So there's bullying and harassment. There's academic bullying and harassment if you, if you side with indigenous communities. You will have, you know, powerful linguists, powerful universities going against you. You will fail job interviews. You know, I was, you know, I had a hard time getting a position. Uh, it took much longer than it sh should have taken, um, kind of stuff. So there's this element out there, but I think, you know, we, we should not carry that around with ourselves and should, you know, somehow keep it 
hidden, try to be calm um, about it, and try to, you know, convince people. Because, you know, emotionalism, if we get emotional, Michael, you know, we undermine our own course. We come across as people, you know, and say, well, you know, what's Michael about? What's Patrick about? You know, he's not even Ryukyu, he's not even Japanese, you know. But of course, you know, when being so long in the field, you know, there's friendships, you know, there's passion, you understand this kind of stuff. So you take these attitudes, you know, you're yourself being pushed and bullied around. So it's not easy to do. And uh, I totally understand if people drop out of that field. You know, it's not easy. And it's, it's difficult to build a career in that field, I think. Yeah. It's, it's not easy at all. So, uh, yes, yeah, somehow we need to think, you know, how to prepare these students uh, for that. And I, I think we need to organize, you know. We need to organize, we need to stop this. this you know, academic harassment is, is quite common, you know. If, if you take, if you don't side with a powerful and you're an academic, you know, it will have consequences. It will have consequences, there's no doubt about that. Well, I agree with you. <laughs> um, well, also there is all this harassment on your own academic environment. And that has happened to me for years and years. I'm in this uh, school of linguistics where the, uh, there are two trends. One is teaching English as a second language and the other one is translation to, to English, mainly to English and French. So to work with indigenous peoples for so many years has been becoming the weirdo in the school, in the school, and being actually harassed for that, you know, getting all sort of nicknames and very discriminatory expressions against me and my little team, which is mainly students, and, and the people I work with. So, um, as you have noticed, these two days, I'm very emotional. But when it comes to this, I am not that emotional. I'm, I'm really sure that what I do is what I wanted to do and what I want to do, and I, hopefully I will be able to do some years from now. But, but it's very difficult to cope with that. It, it's, it's difficult. You just keep on going, you know, somehow. And then, uh, um, of course, working with indigenous communities and working with endangered languages puts you to think about yourself all the time. What's your role? What's the role of academia? What's the role of me, myself, as an individual going into these communities whose languages I don't speak? I cannot speak 13 languages. Well, maybe I could. Many of you do. 15, 20. Well, I don't. So... Um, I think these kind of reflections, and I agree with you, in these kind of situations that we, need, we face, like every day, um, should be a source of lessons for ourselves and then for our students. For those, in my case, very few students who are also interested in the same thing, in all these sociolinguistic studies and anthropological studies and, and um, minoritized languages. Um, I don't think that's going to stop because we're working with um, impoverished people, minoritized people, people of low status. I think that's going to continue, but we just need to be strong enough and, and make sure that that's what we want to do and, and that's what we want to continue doing. I think little by little in academia, things are changing. Um, I'm talking about my own institution, which, which has changed a lot in this sense. I was very surprised about the University of Minnesota having a BA in an indigenous language. That's wonderful. I've been telling you that. And, and then with indigenous communities, I think it's very important for them to know, for us to let them know, we are there to exchange. If we were able to have this like fair trade exchanges, maybe things would be easier for us as academic people. It's not always easy, but that's what we've been, we've been trying to do all these years working in communities. So it's like, I know this much, but there's so much I don't know. You know all this much. And actually, I couldn't show you the last video 
with um, these indigenous people saying, here we are with people from the universities and people from the United States, and we are here to exchange knowledge. They don't know anything. They are not the superstars of knowledge. That's the way he says it. And we don't know everything. Let's exchange. And I know it's difficult, but I think we're able to do it. Um, I've, I've actually experienced that myself from one of my elders. Um, it, it's, it's really hard when one of your own elders tells you that you're foolish. Um, yeah, that's pretty tough. And so I've experienced it myself, and uh, I pretty much let that elder go. Uh, it's, hard because, it's hard because he carries the language that I want for myself. But if he disrespects me like that, um, whew, it's tough. And I had to let him go. And I don't work with him anymore. But it's rare. Yeah, it's tough. Sa interest ng oras at uh, panahon ay panghuling tanong na ang siyang ibibigay ng ginoo sa likod. Uh, pakiusap lamang po na gawing maikli at tuwiran ang pagtatanong. Maraming salamat. Uh, I just wanted to greet everyone. Happy Indigenous Month and National uh, Museum and Galleries uh, Month this October. Uh, my question is uh, regarding uh, technology and tools. So, uh, is the Lexi Pro program open source and can we make use of this? Because in Filipino, as we say, uh, yung mga katutubo palaging pinag-aaralan. We study indigenous people but the point is we should also uh, make them learn or teach new things and learn from them as well. And technology is a tool that uh, we can use. So, let me just... Uh, know if this tools is available for everybody. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, those are free software. You know, as, I, as I've been saying all the time, we have zero money for our projects. So I always work with free software, free web pages. Now we're trying to get something more sophisticated, but yeah, those are free. You download Ilan in um, Lexic Pro in Pratt. And actually, they are very friendly, you know, if you just kind of follow instructions, they are not that difficult. It depends on how sophisticated you want to go, but right now you have all sources of information and you can use it. Now, because they are free softwares, especially Lexi Pro, sometimes it gets a little bit, um, let's say, um, difficult. It stops all of a sudden, or something changes, or you have this kind of funny instructions. If you don't do, if you don't push this, then everything is gone. But we've done it, and we do it, and it's working for us very nicely, actually. I think yes. My students in first semester of linguistics are learning both softwares, and they are so happy, you know, doing this little lexicon about love and bread and, and festivities and drinks, but just to get used to it and to get, you know, kind of mastering the, the program. Um, the other interesting thing is that in, in this free software, you're able, as you saw, you're able to include voices and videos and music and whatever you want and that makes a difference you know especially when when people don't know how to read or write for the indigenous communities it's it's really really nice if they have access to a wi-fi so yeah it's it's free At dito ay pinipinit natin ang habag para sa bukas at malayang talakayan. Sa pagkakataong ito ay ating pagpupugayan, pasasalamatan at gagawaran ng sertipiko ng pagpapahalaga ang ating mga tagapanayam. Tinatawagan ko si tagapangulong Virgilio S. Almario at mga komisyoner ng KWF para sa pagkakaloob ng sertipiko. Mangyaring tumungo lamang po sa unahan.
Kaya ang basahin ko ang nilalaman ng sertipiko. Certificate of Appreciation awarded to Dr. Patrick Heinrich for his outstanding sharing of his time, experience, and expertise as plenary speaker who discussed the development of new models in language revitalization as plenary topic on the International Conference on Language Endangerment held at 6th Floor Conference Center, National Museum of National History, Sudora F. Valencia Circle, Ermita, Manila, Philippines, from October 10th to 12, 2018. Given this 12th of October, 2018, in Manila, Philippines. Signed by uh, Virgilio S. Almario, our national artist and chairperson. Same certificate uh, is awarded also to Dr. Brendan G. Fairbanks. And Dr. Marlene Habut. Muli ay palakpakan natin ang ating mga tagapagsalita. Para sa oras na ito, tayo ay maghahanda na para sa ating tanghalian. Inaasahan namin ang inyong pagbabalik uh, sa bulwagang ito sa ganap na ikaisa at apat na punang hapon. Maraming salamat sa inyo at... Uh,